All right. Hey, good morning, brothers and sisters. It's awesome to be in the house of the Lord. They said it is good to be in the house of the Lord, amen, and again I say amen. It's good to be back. Um, for those of you that have, have uh, made calls and sent cards and stuff, um, the Hawkins family, we're on the mend. Uh, we're both back at work. Becky and I are both back at work. and uh, So we came out the other side of the COVID. My experience was very, very mild. I wouldn't even call it a, a cold, definitely not a flu. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, my wife of 25 years, I have never seen her as sick in her life. Uh, took her to the emergency room, extremely sick, uh, just two totally opposite reactions to it. So it's real. But to God be the glory, uh, we came out on the other side, and it's good to be with you. Let's get into the Word a little bit. Of course, we've been... Studying, becoming more like Jesus. And that's as a Christian, that should be our goal. That should be our focus is to become less like ourselves and more like Christ every passing day. And I'll be honest with you, I have a, a, a strange way that I formulate my lesson plans. And the first thing I do is I look at just the title. And then my mind starts to tell me, well, maybe we'll go to this story in the Bible or this book of the Bible. And when I saw that the lesson was maintaining focus on Jesus, I have to tell you, everything switched to New Testament mode. And after I allowed myself to think about different stories about people that focused on Jesus, and I went back and I looked, the book of Daniel. And uh, God is just so fresh and so full. There, there's always something new that's coming out of the scripture. But let's talk a little bit about Daniel before we get into it. The name Daniel means God is my judge. And if you remember, there were three carrying aways from Jerusalem to Babylon, which is modern day Baghdad area. And I've shared with you many times, I've had a lot of opportunity to see statues and things that were to Nebuchadnezzar and talked about that period of time. And it's, it's really eye opening to even think about some of those things at this later point. But <clears throat> Daniel and a group of other young men were carried away in uh, 605 B.C. when they invaded Jerusalem. There were two subsequent invasions. I had an opportunity one time to do a lesson. It was called Three Old Testament Chapter 9 Prayers. And if you get the opportunity, I, I, I'd urge you to look at Daniel chapter 9, Nehemiah chapter 9, and Ezra chapter 9. If you really want to see some sincere, humble, on my knees, confessing everything to the Lord, recognizing I'm a sinner and God is who he is, look at those three, Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah chapter 9. But it would all be amiss if I didn't take you back the second Chronicles. You recall that Solomon was the wisest man. He asked for wisdom and, and, and God blessed him with that request. And so we often hear Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people who call themselves by my name will humble themselves, then I will heal their land. But you need to read the chapters coming up to that where Solomon is pouring out in legal terms. Well, if we disobey you, God, and we get captured by other countries, and we get taken away to other countries, if you hear our repentance, and you hear our, will, will you return us to our land? If we disobey, and, and you close up the, the sky, and, and, and we have famine, and we have pestilence, and all this, if we will return to you, will you have mercy on us? And, and so all these things that Solomon is praying, leading up to the dedication of the temple. And then, of course, God comes back and says, yes, I'll meet that condition. If you will return to me, my love will pour out again. And so it's in that same sentiment that Daniel comes into this prayer here. There is stories coming back that the inhabitants in Jerusalem... The walls are tore down. The temple's tore down. There are people in disarray. All of their enemies are laughing and, 
and, and making fun of them and talking about their God couldn't do anything and putting them down. And so not only is Daniel here in Babylon dealing with the things that he's dealing with there, but he's also praying for those that are separated, those that are still left in the land of Jerusalem who aren't faring well at all. When we find this, when we first start reading this, Daniel brings it out. He said that he had been deep in reading, deep in processing the books, the scripture, and especially Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, you recall, was told to warn the people of Jerusalem that after Solomon's time, when there was a split between the northern and the southern kingdom, that there was going to be a carrying away, that they were going to be conquered, taken into captivity. And Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, he tells them of all the things that God has put on his lips to say. And so that's where we find where Daniel is at, as he has just finished up reading, reading really into the Word. And I need to put this in perspective. This lesson is about maintaining focus on Jesus. And again, when I thought about maintaining focus on Jesus, my mind went to the New Testament. But understand that the Word is Jesus. John's Gospel said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh. The Bible tells us that the Word is the truth, that the Scripture is the truth. And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. So, if you don't get anything else out of this lesson, I ask that you get this. You get close to Jesus by reading the Scripture. You maintain focus on Jesus by reading the Word. Prayer is us talking to God. But reading the Word is God talking to us. Amen? If you would bow with me in prayer, and let's ask God to illuminate the scripture we're going to read here today. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for your son. We recognize who we are. We are sinners. We are lost without you. We are separated by sin from a righteous God. And we're made righteous only through the blood of your son, through the sacrificial lamb, the one that died and took the sins of the world that if we believe in him, we may have eternal life. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be in a public place. Thank you for the opportunity for the social medias to, to get this word out. And Lord, if it be your will, we ask that the Spirit would draw others to Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. It's a loving church. It's a God-fearing church. And it's a full scripture. You can't pick and choose here. It's the whole word, nothing but the word. So, Lord, let us spend this time together. And anything that comes out good of it, of course, is coming back to you. You said your word would not go out void, that it will return. And so we're asking that everything that is said and done here is pleasing and glorifying to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. And it says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Asherus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Now many times the Medes, Babylonians, Chaldeans, they're all in that same area, which is modern-day Iraq or northwestern Iran. And it talks about this entire area. But understand the word Asherus was a Hebrew word, and its Persian meaning is Xerxes. Many of you have seen movies about Xerxes and Artaxerxes. Xerxes was a royal title, like in Egypt, Pharaoh would be a royal title. Not necessarily a specific person, but a royal title. So it says, in the first year of 
Darius. And that place is that about 586 B.C. Verse 2, he says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. We could spend hours just talking about that right there. But Jeremiah talked about the 70 years of desolation, the 70 years where Jerusalem was going to be laid waste before there was a beginning to return back to Jerusalem. And you'll recall in Nehemiah, there was halts put on building the walls back. They would go in and, and attempt to build the walls, but until the time was fulfilled, the walls were not built back. That 70-year period had to be answered because that was God's plan. But Daniel here, he says, I was in the reading, I was in the scripture, I was studying the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah's scripture, and I understood the 70 years of desolations, desolations plural, not a singular, not a 70 years, but a desolation on top of a desolation on top of another desolation, 70 years of Jerusalem. What we see here is that engaging with the revelation helps us focus on Christ. You see, Daniel, the book itself is called an apocalypse. The book of the Revelations is called an apocalypse. Ezekiel has apocalyptic parts to it. The word apocalypse means an unveiling. Oh, I'm getting chills just thinking about it. You see, when Jesus Christ came here to earth, it was an unveiling. It was a revealing of God himself. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus was incarnate God so that we could see and understand the nature and the magnitude and the depth of love for each and every one of us that none should perish but that all should have everlasting life. And so you see here that he is set about engaging with the revelation. He's been reading Jeremiah's scripture. He's been capturing and praying and fasting and supplicating. It's going to talk about all that. But he wants to get close to God, and he's doing so by getting in God's word. Amen? Have you ever felt so low you don't know where to go? You pick up this Bible. Why is it that Bibles were put in all these different hotel rooms? And stuff? Somebody's on the road, they're lonely. They're discomfited. You need God's word. The Bible tells us that we're to ingest the word to have it for that time that we'll need it. If you've never ingested it, if you've never read it, if you've never studied it, how can you call upon it in time of need? To maintain our focus on Jesus, we have to get in the word. We've got to get serious and do business with God. But not only do we have to engage with the revelation, the revelations that come to us through the scripture, in verse 3, you have to express the humiliation that heightens your focus. Let's look at verse 3. In my Bible, the subheading said, Daniel's confession and prayer. Let's see what he's confessing and praying about. He says, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. What does that mean? He's focusing on God. He's getting deep in it. You see here that there's three practices that he's observing. He's praying, he's petitioning, and he's fasting. Those are the practices. But more important is the posture. You say, what do you mean by the posture? Well, his posture was one of humility. He was covered in sackcloth. The sackcloth is a very, not a, not a finished cloth. It's a very scratchy, itchy, uncomfortable garment. And he's placed ashes on his head and all around himself. He is humble. He is in the utmost of humility. He is recognized 
his sinful state, his separation from God, the things that are wrong in his life and his kinmen. Because when he prays, he's not only praying for Daniel, but he's praying for the nation of Israel. So he, he does the right practices. He gets in the right posture. In verse 4 he says, And I prayed unto the Lord my God, the Lord my God, my personal God, not some God out there, not a wishing well, but a God that he has often spoke to, drawn knowledge and experience from. This is his God. I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God. That word dreadful there means reverent. It means that he is so great that he gets all of my reverence and respect. He said, I pray to the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. There you see that he recognizes that God is a God of covenant. The Bible is a covenant to mankind. And we've talked about this many times. There are promises that are unconditional and there are promises that are conditional. That 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, if my people, that's conditional. Not all of them are conditional, but some of them are. Some you've got to obey and show your love and your obedience. And others, they're just granted. But he, he recognizes that I'm praying to you, God. You are a God of covenant. You are a God of promise. Verse 5, he says, we have sinned. He shifts from I to we. Who's the we he's talking about? He's talking about the nation of Israel. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Now, if you took that back over to 2 Chronicles, where Solomon was praying this legalese type of prayer, it almost matches piece for piece. There's not a corner that's offset. It, it, you could lay a level on it and it's plumb. All the bubbles are, are good. Solomon had said, if all these things happen, and we get taken away, and we forget to call on the name of the Lord, and we forget his laws and his... his uh, uh, commandments. If we do all these things and we turn into wickedness and we go back into um, idol worship and all these other things, if we remember you and we call out your name and we beg for your mercy, will you hear us? God said, I will. You see, that works in our personal life. How many things have we done in our life that we've turned away from God? We knew right from wrong. A little child knows right from wrong. But we made decisions and there's consequences for those decisions. I'm not the man I want to be. I'm not the man that God's going to make me into. But I have made serious mistakes in my life. And God has dealt with me. And he has dealt with me and he has taught me through love, through the punishments and the consequences. And you could probably say the same for yourself. But he says, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled. Some notes that I had here I wanted to share with you. Five confessions. Number one, sin. Sin means to miss the mark or to do wrong. I check the box on that one. He says, we have committed iniquity. Committed iniquity is the explanation to warp or to twist. We have taken what God has told us and we have warped it or twisted it, turned it away from that which was good into that which is evil. The third thing he confesses is that he's done wickedly to be evil, to be guilty of disobedience. Number four, we have rebelled. And number five, we have departed from thy precepts and from thy judgments. We've, we've failed in every way we possibly could. Here he is talking to his God, confessing. 
Verse 6, he says, Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Now you think about this. Here's Daniel. He's taken into Babylon. They change his name to Belteshazzar. We remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We remember that these young men were brought up, and they would not allow themselves to be given over to this false god, to this false way of the, of the Babylonians. They stood their ground. And if you recall for that, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were put into the fiery furnace, and it was cranked up more than it had ever been. And you recall what was said when they looked upon, and, and, and the men came out, there was no smell of smoke on them, there were no soot, their hair was not singed, there was nothing, there was total protection. Let me go back over to Daniel chapter 3. I'll share just a little bit of this with you. Daniel chapter 3, starting verse 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it would want to be heated. Seven times hotter. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The ones that led them up to the fiery furnace, they were consumed to death by the heat of this fire. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, now listen to this. Did we, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto the king, true, O king. And he, Nebuchadnezzar, answered and said, lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth one is like the Son of God. That coming from a non-believer, that coming from a man who hated everything about the one true God, and he says, there's one amongst them that looks like the Son of God. I'm just getting cold chills. I've shared with you before that it took me years to understand. In my mind, the Old Testament was God, the New Testament was Jesus. Jesus is all in the Old Testament. Sometimes it's hard to see. But here you've got a ruler of Babylon saying, I see the Son of God. So Daniel, getting back to, to Daniel chapter 9, we see that he engaged the revelation about Jesus. He expressed humiliation that heightens our focus on Christ. He executes the supplication that holds our focus. After verse 7, well, let's read verse 7. He says, O Lord, righteous belongeth unto thee. Righteousness belongeth unto thee. But unto us confusion of faces, as at this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. Again, everything that Solomon had basically predicted came true. They were scattered abroad. They were defeated. They were inhabitants in foreign lands. They were not allowed to practice their religion, not openly. And then we go to verses 17 through 19 to close this out. So Daniel makes his prayer. 
He makes his confession. He prays to God for mercy and for forgiveness. And here in verses 17 through 19, he closes his prayer. Now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. He's saying there's a temple that was set aside for you. We have totally screwed this up. We have disobeyed. We are scattered. We need to get back to you. He said, if you find any favor in what I'm saying, shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. It appalled him that his God was being cast down by the other nations, cast down by citizens of the, of the surrounding areas. He said, I'm not asking this just for my sake. I'm not asking this just for this group of people, but I'm asking it for your name's sake. Restore your name and make it great. For thy great mercies. And in verse 19, listen closely. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. We talk about the problems in America. We talk about we want to get right in America. We need to look at this prayer. We need to look at this man, Daniel. We need to look at how he sought out God through the scripture, through his confession of what he had done, of what his nation had done. He fell on his knees in humility and sackcloth and ashes, and he prayed earnestly to his God. That's where it starts. That's where the rubber hits the road. There's not going to be any change in America until we get serious about what we need to do to restore ourselves. We are just like the Israelites. We have fell into all these different ideas, misconceptions. We have got so far away from the truth of God that we're holding accountability right now we are feeling the wrath and the consequences of the decisions that we and our forefathers have made by turning against the precepts that God has put in his book oh Lord have mercy on us dear Lord we thank you for your scripture we thank you for the understanding we thank you and we ask that you'd make us brave like a Daniel a Daniel that says only God can judge me I'm not going to be judged by men and rulers in this country, but only God can judge me. He took a stand. He said, I'm not eating that filthy food that's been offered up to false gods. I'm not bowing to that golden statue. I'm not having anything to do with any of that because it goes against what my God told me. Give us that boldness, Lord. Help us to be the people that you want us to be, to stand up for the, those that are unborn, those that are on the fringes of society. We're to give a voice to all that you love each and every one of us. No, you don't love the sins, but you love the people. And your spirit is drawing and saying, come home. Come home, come home. Lord, accept this, our confession. Lord, accept this, our prayer. Lord, see us on our knees. Listen to what we're asking of you in, in all due reverence and humility. Lord, make us yours. Cover us with your blood and make us righteous with the Father. In Jesus' name, we ask all these things. Amen.